Hey, I'm John Allure. Before you listen to this episode, a couple of things. These are podcasts from the first season of Who Killed Teresa? And they're very raw. They were unedited. I haven't gone back and checked over them. Um, I pondered about whether I should do these. Um, many people found them, and I do, amateurish and, and kind of uh, not very good, but others really kind of liked that 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 raw nature to them. So I've just released them as as they are. It, don't come to me asking questions about them. It uh, you know this was an iterative process. So what I thought um, seven years ago is not what I believe today. And then on that note, I, I'll be closing down. Who killed Teresa? Um, over the next six months, we'll, we'll I'll run the remaining of the first season episodes. But I've started a new podcast called Undiluted Hocus Pocus, The Wonder of Problems. We'll talk about puzzles and games, and sometimes we'll talk about unsolved murders and police negligence. And you can find that on Spreaker at Undiluted Hocus Pocus. Uh, also, you can check it out on all your major platforms Spotify and uh, iTunes, etc., and we'll set up social media pages for it as well. So uh, it's a pretty unique name, Undiluted Hocus Pocus. If you put it into a search engine, I'm sure you'll find us. Thanks for listening, and once again, life isn't fair, justice is blind and dysfunctional, and some cops aren't smart like on television. This is Who Killed Teresa. Welcome to the podcast. This is Who Killed Teresa, and I'm your host, John Allure. In this podcast, we discuss the murder of 19-year-old Canadian college student Teresa Allure, who was my sister. She disappeared on Friday, November 3rd, 1978, from Champlain College in Lennoxville, which is in the eastern townships of Quebec. And we investigate uh, a number of cases which are geographically similar, and those are the deaths of Sharon Pryor, Lee Choquette, Louise Cameron, Jocelyn Houle, Chantelle Tremblay, Joanne Dorian, Helen Monast, Catherine Hawkes, Denise Bazinet, Manon Zupé, Lison Blay, Teresa Lore, Nicole Goudreau, Tammy Leakey, and Joanne Lemieux. It's a show where life isn't fair, justice is blind and dysfunctional, and some cops aren't smart and dedicated like on television. I was rummaging through my, uh, my desk and I found something uh, I found this program for a play, The Tea House of the August Moon, which played at St. Thomas High School, um, May 4th, 5th, 6th, and 7th, 1977, so 40 years ago. And I remember this well. This is the first play that I ever saw, and my sister... Teresa took me to it. I was a seventh grade student at St. Thomas High School, which was in the West Island of Montreal. And we went to see it uh, over the weekend. I remember she drove us there. The program describes the play. Uh, it's a pleasantly ironic story of the West meeting the East, told with both satire and humor. It appeared on Broadway in 1953 and won both the Critics Circle Award and the Pulitzer Prize. Now, <laughs> it's, it's an absolutely awful racist play and should never be performed again. <laughs> but there it is. I also remember uh, Teresa taking me to a variety show at St. Thomas High. And the skit that I like best is they did this skit called uh, Cinderelton, which was a take on Cinderella with the lead being played by an Elton John character, which I thought was quite 
clever. That was my introduction to theater, was through uh, my sister's influence. And people who know me know that uh, theater has always been a part of uh, my life. Uh, I studied to be an actor in New York City and spent significant uh, time in uh, New York City, Toronto, and Los Angeles before realizing that very few could actually make a living as a performer, <laughs> uh, let alone someone with, with children. So I quickly transferred to something else that could make money. But nevertheless, for the last 40 years, I've maintained a foot in the door with theater. Uh, it's, what I, it's what I do in my evenings uh, to kind of get away from work and this. And I find it uh, very satisfying. And the other thing is, uh, if my sister uh, ever learned that... I spent all of my time occupied on these cases. She would kick my ass. So a lot of it is always keeping a portion of my life separate from this stuff. Or I can go away and be creative with a community of people. And the origins all started with... Uh, her 40 years ago. Coming up on another anniversary this spring, it's the 50th anniversary of Expo 67. And for those of you who don't know what that was, that was, I'd characterize it as the last really special world's fair that Montreal hosted. On par with what they did in Seattle or Chicago or New York City. After that, it, I think there was one in Vancouver, but world fairs fell out of favor. And all of that was a, was a very interesting time in Montreal. I think we've discussed this a little bit. In 1967, it was really wonderful. Montreal was coming into its own all these infrastructure projects, new bridges, and new tunnels, and a new subway, uh, transformed an island in the middle of the St. Lawrence into a theme park with a monorail. And, you know, the whole thing pretty much modeled after Disney World in, in Orlando, Florida. Montreal and Canada's own version or first version of, of Disney World. And then, of course, in, in 1976, we had the, the Olympics. So again, I mean, these, these were really good times. And I remember attending both of these events with my family. But buttressed, well, this is what buttressed in the middle of that um, came some really terrible times in 1970, the October crisis, where we had the FLQ terrorist group setting off bombs throughout Montreal in protest for liberation. Pierre Trudeau calls in the National Guard. There's the, the army on street corners. There's checkpoints. There's all of that. And we discussed this a little bit, the possibility that the offender, Luke Gregoire, because he was in the Airborne and because the Airborne were a portion of that detail a tie, a, a, attached to security in 1970, that it could very well have been that he was acting in a position of protecting citizens from terrorists. Ironic and disturbing and confusing. And then I also note that, uh, you know, uh, we talked about investigators who have touched this case. Leo Hamel, who was the first police chief in Lennoxville to be assigned the Teresa Laura missing person case, how he had 
he had worked security at, I believe, this the night Expo 67. He had later, later been a security guard at Vanier College. Teresa attended to Vanier College for a semester. And then, of course, uh, uh, Robert Bulak, a private investigator who came to the aid of my family, was uh, also a security guard at Expo 67. They they beefed up security uh, for the 76 Olympics, not only because of the violence from the October crisis in 1970, but certainly because of the events that unfolded in Munich in 72. They wanted no, no repeat of of what happened in, in Munich to go on during the uh, Montreal Olympics. So this was, um, we've had in people who've touched this talk about those, the times when these crimes unfolded. And we've talked about 75 to 81, but we'll get to a case from 1970. Being very confusing times where the lines were blurred you didn't one one investigator said you didn't know who was wearing the white hat and the black hat um it was very confusing for us as, as kids for all of this to be going on uh i had all i ever knew was growing up in montreal and it, looking back it, it was a big sophisticated city i don't think it was until a school trip to Toronto when I was in grade 12, so 1982, that I, that's the first time I saw another comparable big city, uh, Toronto. Interesting times. I want to switch now to uh, something I, I found. It's about a 10-minute interview I did with the CBC in Montreal about a year ago. I think I'll play it because it gives a little context and background on these things. So I'll play that 10 minute tape and then we'll discuss some things discussed in that tape and then we'll move on and we'll, we'll discuss our main topic today, which is a case from my, uh, Montreal in 1974-75. It's the case of the full moon killer. The case of 19-year-old Teresa Allure is one people in Lennoxville remember. She disappeared in 1978. She was a student at Champlain College, and five, five months after her disappearance, her body was found in nearby Compton, Quebec. When her brother, John Allure, set out to try to find out what happened to her, he uncovered a grisly pattern. Looking at the Montreal area and the eastern townships, he says he found about 20 cases with striking similarities. He believes it's likely there was a serial killer active during that period, and now his research has sparked interest from the SQ's cold case unit. Kate McGilvery had the chance to speak with John Allure about his research and his recent talks with that unit. She joins us live from our Sherbrooke studio. Good morning. Good morning. What has John Allure heard from the cold case unit? So after fighting for it some time, he's gotten the news that his sister's name will be placed on the cold case list that the SQ keeps. So this is hard won. And what it means is that the case is on their radar and they are re-examining it. So the reason why he there was difficulty getting this name on this list is because they're treated as a suspicious death. His, his sister's case is not considered a murder. But despite the fact that it's still classified as a suspicious death, it's now on the list. It's now in their crosshairs. So that... That's a big deal. Um, he was also able to get a meeting with the head of the SQ cold case unit. So as you just mentioned, he sees a connection between his sister and almost 20 other murders in the late 70s. So when he went to meet with the head of the U SQ cold case uh, unit, which is Mark Lapine, he had a point that he really wanted to get across. The only way to solve these cases is to look at them not in isolation. In, in, in isolation, they're dead. Um, but to, in looking at them together in the hope that, you know, you might find a connection on the assumption that somebody was committing these offenses in a series just might get you there. And I, I have 
I'm optimistic that the SQ now gets that. So he walked out feeling confident, feeling that they they might just be listening to him. They might see the importance of looking at these cases together, which which is what he feels. How did he come to be looking at the cases together? So John Allure had always been told that his sister died of a drug overdose, and that was something that never really sat right with him. So around the time he started having his own children, which is in the early 2000s, he felt the need to start getting some answers finally. He began his search, and he immediately found some documents he had never seen before. Certain documents turned up things that made me very unsatisfied. Key would be the final coroner report, which determined that Teresa died a violent death of undetermined means. That was the actual designation. So that's not drugs. And then the second was a a coroner's um, report from the time that the body was discovered, um, which had been hidden from the family for years that said she had, the victim has uh, marks of strangulation around her neck. And at that point, I, I realized that something much deeper that's when I learned of t- two other unsolved murders in the, the eastern townships at that time. Um, and they all uh, appeared to have interesting relationships with each other. So that's where it began. So right away after a little research, he's seeing multiple cases that strike him as quite, quite similar. And he, he feels very compelled to keep researching. And he began with three cases in the townships. How did he jump to looking at the entire Montreal region? So by now, Alora was already thinking about a serial killer, uh, someone who repeatedly offended, and he felt that it only made sense to start to zoom out a little bit, start looking a little bit before those cases, those three cases, and go back in time a little bit. That's how he found the case of Denise Bazinet. So she was from Montreal. Her body was found halfway between the townships and the Montreal area. Because of this Bazinet linchpin, you had justification to look at unsolved cases in Montreal. By now, you know, what I'm looking at is about 20 cases that I'm not saying they're all connected. And I certainly think that that some of the things that I've discovered will turn out to be coincidences. That's always the case. And you always have to be careful about, you know, buying into your own theories. But I certainly think that there's um, aspects that need to be pursued in these cases. What connections does John Allure see between all those cases? There are two things we really talked about. Uh, First of all is strangulation, which John tells me is not a particularly common form of murder. So he sees that pattern. Um, Also the fact that the women were found outdoors. In a large um, amount of homicides, they they occur in homes, either in a friend's home or in the victim's home or the assailant's home. So to have it uh, as an outdoor thing in these Wooded areas where there's there's often the victims found under trees or near a body of water is an even more specific subset that we're getting to. So by looking at where they were found, how they were found, and plotting it out all on a map, specifically geography is really important to his research to look at. Okay, she lives close to her. This happened then. This same area. He sees a connecting thread there. Okay, so John Allure certainly has some compelling similarities. This sounds like a really painful exercise, though, for someone who's grieving his sister to go through. What kind of hope does he have of getting something out of this? Well, one of the driving forces here is that Allure feels that the police have not handled these cases correctly at all. And he's not alone in feeling that way. The families in all of these instances, including mine, have experienced from the police agency that they've dealt with, with criminal investigative failures on the part of the police. And this spans three different police forces, so the SQ, the Longueuil Police, and the Montreal Police. Basically, beyond the intense loss these families have faced, they also say they've faced police departments who've kept information from them, who've botched their investigations. Especially painful for these families is the practice of destroying evidence. You know, in my case, the physical evidence, uh, Teresa's, my sister's bra and underwear, which could potentially have contained DNA, was destroyed. The only way to solve a case is through through confession or through a, an eyewitness or through physical evidence. The older these people get, and we're talking now of an offender in, in you know, f- for murders that occurred in 77, 78, who has to be at least 60 or 70 let alone the people who may know something 60 or 70. So eventually they're going to die off. So there goes that method of solving the case. So what's left? What's left is the physical evidence. Well, if you're systematically destroying evidence, 
you've taken away all means for these cases to be solved. That's John Allor. And there is some action on that front, right? A group of families is calling for an inquiry. That's right. So as of last week, eight families, including the Allors, are calling for an inquiry. They want to see what they what they call police negligence in these cases. They want that looked at. And they're also calling for some rules to be changed. For example, no more destruction of evidence in these cases and more access to information for the families of murder victims. So they're more in the loop and they understand what's happening in an investigation. Because that has to be a, a huge impact on one's emotions in, when you're already involved in, in losing someone. What about John Allure's emotional life? He spent a lot of time on this. Has this brought him any relief? John told me that when he first started looking at this, he was just very, very, very angry. And in a way, he says he, he still is. Anger is still a part of his emotions as he looks at this stuff. But over the years, there's been an evolution in how he feels. I know when to run with it and I know when to stop. Um... I know enough not to do this after 7 o'clock at night, you know, to have good um, friends and family around you. Um, that, that's the way that, I, that I'm able to do it. So, you know, the image of, I don't know what image anyone has of me, but, you know, if, if it's, you know, this kind of lone wolf staying up to the late hours, I can tell you it's nothing like that. And I wouldn't survive if it, if it were that way. We spoke for a long time about how he keeps that balance in his life. He has he has three children. He does theater. I saw, I was looking through his Twitter. He had posted something about swing dancing. He, he tries to keep a balance, even as he delves into this, this very um, intense and unpleasant subject matter. But he does say, despite keeping a balance in his life, he feels a compulsion to keep going. He, he's compelled to keep researching. Does John Allure think he'll ever see any of those cases solved? That's still his hope. So I, I got the impression he sees everything in the lens of the case. Getting the word out is very important to him. For example, there's a, a film being made by Stéphane Parent called Cette Femme. It's about a group of these murders, including Teresa Allure, John's sister. I asked him, what do you think about this movie? And he immediately brought up the hope that maybe an old timer will see it. Maybe they'll know something. Maybe they'll remember something. So that's really how he sees it. On another level, he's also proud to see the progress that's being made in the way the police handle these kind of cases. Well, success for me is these very small incremental changes. And I, th I, th I, think, I think a big victory would be to, to have one of these cases solved, at least one. And I, I don't care which one it is. I, you know, I'm not saying please solve my sister's case, any of them, because, because they all have so much in common that it would be as if Teresa's case were solved. So on one front, he's already feeling some success. He's met with the SQ cold case unit. Her name is now on the list. They're calling, they have this calling for an inquiry. On the other front, solving one of the cases, there's still a long, long way to go. Indeed. Thank you, Kate. Thanks so much. Kate McGilvery, our townships reporter, live in our Sherbrooke studio with the story of John Allure and his long, long battle to try to figure out what happened uh, to his sister, Teresa, who died at the age of 19 when she was a student at Champlain College in Lennoxville. Just a few things to follow up from that since the, that was a year ago. Number one is the Quebec inquiry. Just to say that that thing has a life of its own that I'm not really in charge of. There are lawyers involved and they keep adding uh, cases, uh, families of victims to the file, to the appeal. And that process will bear out what it bears out when it does and I'll be notified. But it's not something that I am actively in charge of. It's something that I'm a participant in. And the second thing is the the matter of the the film uh, Cette Femme by Stéphane Perron. And we th this film comes up a lot and people may wonder, well, when's it going to be finished? What's the timeline? Understand that uh, Steph is uh, an independent producer in Quebec working on a shoestring budget. When he gets time and money, he completes a segment of it on a particular victim, then he stops for a while, does another. So that too will, it, it has its own life. And I'm, again, I'm a participant in it, but I'm not involved in the production of it. It will be released when it 
is released and I'll be informed. So moving on to our main topic, as I said, uh, this is a 1974-75 case, the case of the murders of Norma O'Brien and Debbie Fisher, Fisher by someone who became dubbed as the either the Chattagay killer or the Full Moon killer. And these are cases that were actually solved. Someone was arrested and charged and sent away. But as we see, there's there's a lot in in these Chattagay murders um, that is worth mentioning in reference to the other cases. They, in some ways, inform those cases. So... We're, we're going to take a stab at this. These murders were sensational at the time. This was not your case of a Lise en Blay who barely got a mention in the paper. These were, were large affairs with a lot of public interest because of the age of the, the, young, the young girls. Norma O'Brien and Debbie Fisher were two young girls who went missing in the town of Chattagay, and that's a community off the island of Montreal, known as the South Shore. So as you might imagine, it's across the St. Lawrence, Lawrence River on the South Shore of, of Montreal. If you go north from Chattagay, you hit Longay. And of course, if you cross the bridge from Chattagay back into Montreal, you're right around the Point Saint Charles area, the the area where Tammy Leakey, if you recall, she's the 12 year old girl who was murdered in '81, girl with these impossibly large glasses. Point Saint Charles is also a 1975 case of Sharon Pryor. 16-year-old blonde girl whose photo I see most is Sharon in a checked shirt. The incidents uh, happen one year apart in 1974 and 75. And in each case, these girls, they, they were missing for a very short period, approximately 24 hours before their bodies were found. And as I said, this is a case where the assailant was actually caught and convicted. But as we'll see, the outcome was less than satisfactory. And it's left many questions even to this day. Because the incidents occurred during a new moon or a full moon cycle, the press dubbed the perpetrator Le Manique Plein Lune or Full Moon Killer. Now, I, I don't care a whole lot about moon theory and criminal behavior. It clearly had its period when it was very de rigueur in the 70s. Many, many believe that the Zodiac, or Sam, as he liked to be called, who was active in the late 60s and 70s, to be a, a, a moon phase killer. And then later, of course, in 1970s, we had David Berkowitz, son of Sam. Reportedly, he killed five of his eight victims during a full moon. It wasn't just a matter of people getting up to sort of all sorts of mischief under the full moon's influence. Common lore said that if you did the profile right, you could predict when the murderer might kill again. And we see this cliche acted out in dozens of films, and there must be a Dirty Harry movie that I'm just forgetting where Callahan's in the race against time before the moon starts waxing full. The Quebec press was crazy for moon murders in the 1970s as well. And I'm going to give you um, a rundown of an article that appeared in Allo Police in June of 1978. It's, it's less an article, it's more of an insert, and it just says, Sept Meurtres. And it basically says this. It says, one, Les Amblais was murdered June 4th in Montreal. Two, soon after, a taxi driver in Ramuski was killed. 
Three, a man who disappeared the previous September was found attached to a cinder block in the Ottawa River. Four, in an apparent crime of passion, a secretary died in Montreal. Five, some guy at a restaurant was shot in the head. Six, a prisoner was stabbed 120 times. And seven, a biker was beaten to death in Trois-Rivières. And the article says, what do these murders have in common? The previous weekend was a full moon. Full exclamation. C'est pour les tenants de l'estrologie. Il est à noter que cette fois-ci, cette crise de violence s'est produite en dehors de la période de pleine lune. La semaine dernière, c'était la nouvelle lune de juin. All of this is very poetic, but it's not very true. Debbie Fisher did indeed disappear during a full moon, June 23rd, 1975. However, Norma O'Brien disappeared July 9th, 1974, a large moon, but waning with about 80% visibility. So, despite all the attempts to connections to, of moon phasings, there's, there was very little in that, that that had anything to do with these cases. But to this day, they remain tagged uh, with that moniker. As I've said before, connecting two points on a map isn't correlation or causation. It's just two dots on a map. Norma O'Brien. 12-year-old Norma O'Brien, went. she went missing on Tuesday evening, July 9th, 1974. She left her home at 94 Rue La Cerne in the evening to play water pole at the local pool on St. Francis Boulevard. When she arrived at the pool, she discovered that it was closed for repairs. So she decides to walk home. It's about 8.30 at night. She's reported missing that evening, and the family insists that Norma was not a runaway. The following day, around 3.45 in the afternoon, Norma's naked body is discovered in a field close to the pool about 1,500 feet from the road. And she's discovered by Charles Baranowski, the manager of the pool. On seeing the body, Baranowski puts his hands to his head and cries, no, no, no. Police detectives arrive, not only from the Chattagay police force, but also from the Sarté du Québec, they find that uh, O'Brien is on her back, she's been beaten, she was raped, and the cause of her death was asphyxiation, most likely caused by her hairbrush, which was shoved down her throat. Police used scythes to search the area where the body was found, but no evidence was recovered that could lead to a suspect. And the case went cold. Less than a year later, Jean-Baptiste Day weekend, 1975, 14-year-old Debbie Fisher is coming home from her uncle's house at 6 Rue Saint-Luc. It's about 6.30 p.m. on Monday, June 23, 1975. Fisher's on a red bicycle with a banana seat. Her home at 167 Rue Vieux is about 10 minutes away. She never makes it home. Given the location of the disappearance, about 10 minutes from where Norma O'Brien was found, police immediately put a helicopter in the air, hoping to find Fisher quickly, possibly in the same field off Boulevard Saint Francis. Fisher is found the day after her disappearance, Tuesday, June 24th, by three neighbors of Fisher's who decide to search the surrounding wooded area for the young girl. Fisher is discovered in an abandoned car in the woods off Rue Brisebois. Fisher is found naked, but not sexually assaulted. 
She died from being beaten on the head with a rock. Let me explain to you the, the scenes of the crimes, and I'll post these photos on the website. In both these cases, this was a big deal. In the, in the O'Brien case, where they're searching the field, there's got to be, a, just in this photo, um, a half dozen officers that we see uh, six or seven cars stopped along the road, and as described, they're, they're going through the field with scythes. In the case of uh, Debbie Fisher, it, it might be because it was the Quebec holiday, Saint-Jean-Baptiste Day, but there's a scene of, it just, it it looks like a scene in Jaws on Memorial Day weekend when everybody arrives at the beach, the this, the street is absolutely jam-packed with cars and people. There's a, there's a photo of the, the helicopter that they mentioned, the Certe de Quebec helicopter flying over a field. But my absolutely favorite photo, and I think I've referenced this before, um, it's from the point of view of someone sitting in the passenger seat of a Sarté de Québec's detective's car looking out the driver's side window. And we see in the driver's side window an SQ officer holding a screwdriver, which obviously had been recovered from this field. He's holding it by the, the tip, so the, the metal end, you know, the point where if, if you were to use it as a shiver a shank you would be stabbing and there would be blood on it so he's holding it by that end and handing it through the window to the other uh detective and clearly you see that neither are wearing gloves quebec police again displaying their superior evidence handling techniques Now, with the immediate discovery of the, the, the body, police catch a lucky break. A man driving a 1970s Buick remembers almost hitting a kid driving a yellow moped. If you don't know what a moped is, it's like one of those little tiny uh, motocyclette, uh, a mini bike, I guess you'd call it. Not quite a motorcycle, but in between a motorcycle and a bicycle, I guess we'll call it that. And this is near the woods where Fisher was discovered on that Monday, uh, June 23rd, 75. Police arrest an 18-year-old man who I'm going to refer to going forward here as MX, the initials M and X. And I don't remember why I gave it that name. At one time that had some kind of hidden meaning, uh, but I forget what it is. <laughs> Nevertheless... MX it is. At the time of the murders, he was 16 and then 17. On July 15th, he confessed to the murder of Debbie Fisher. He was tried as a minor, convicted and found guilty on March 21st, 1977. And because he was a minor, a publication ban was put in place barring anyone from printing his name. Now, despite the fact that over 40 years have passed, and I feel somewhat pr protected because I, I live in the United States, I really don't want to test the zeal of the Canadian criminal courts. So we're going to stick with the name MX. However, anyone who would like to know his name, all you need to do is go to Christian Gravener's blog, Coolopolis, which is about, uh, I would call it about social deviance in the city of Montreal, and just look for his post on the Chattagay killer and read the comments. I'm not necessarily saying that he's named there. I'm saying there's some good information from folks who had firsthand experience at the time, and you can, you can quickly figure things out. Now, about 
that blog post. It, it's interesting that I think Chris put that up oh, years ago, and it continues to be one of the most actively commented upon posts uh, on his blog. People to this day are very interested in the Fisher and O'Brien cases. And because of that, there's, there's actually a lot of misinformation and uh, rumors that have persisted over these past 40 years. And some of it, I, I think it would, it, it would be worth uh, clearing up right now. First off, MX was not the mayor's son. The mayor was Joseph Labarge. Memek's father's name was Jean-Claude. I don't know how this became an urban myth, but it's not without precedent. In Teresa's case, Teresa Lore, my sister's case, one of the first whisperings was the mayor's son did it. And perhaps this comes from the fear that power can operate above the law and the idea that the, the, the worst thing that you could think of is that the most powerful member of a community uh, symbolically if somehow could be immune to the process of uh, punishment. Second, the yellow moped was only a factor in the Fisher case, not the O'Brien case. MX had a 1975 model moped. So in 1974, he was still riding a bike, a bicycle. Where Fisher lived some distance from MX, O'Brien and MX were practically neighbors. MX lived at 249 Rue Mountain, about a 10-minute walk or a four-minute bike ride from 94 Place Lucerne, where O'Brien uh, lived. Third thing to clear up, um, and this has come up, I'm, I'm not MX. Just because I know a lot, that doesn't make me the murderer. And I feel sorry for, there's a number of people on the Kulopolis site, uh, particularly a French guy, who offered a whole lot of information and then immediately all these readers started to attack him and accuse him of being the murderer. The French guy knew the best information because the French papers, like Allo Police, always had the best information. So don't knock a guy just because he's doing his research. And concerning research, and this is the last point I want to make, uh, MX didn't rape Fisher, but that was certainly his intention. And how do I know this? Because I have a copy of the confession. And how do I have that? Well, I've said it many times. When you make a public information request, Sometimes in the records you receive, there are Easter eggs. And in the case of the uh, information that I went over for this cases, oops, there in the file was a, a police document with the entire confession, just waiting for anyone in the public to read. And here's what the confession tells us. So this kid, MX, was coming home from work on his moped, and it's about 6.30 at night. He sees Fisher around Rue Saint-Luc riding her red bike with the banana seat, and she's carrying a bag with a container of milk in it. He passes her. He says hi. She says hi. He then rides ahead and stashes his moped in the bushes, sits down on the curb, and pretends to be crying. When she sees him crying, she stops. He says, come here a minute. She does. He grabs her and begins groping her. He tosses the milk in the field. He hits her on the head with the rock. Then he hides her bike in the bushes by a tree. At this point, she's unconscious. This is, just to clarify, this is Fisher we're talking about, the second case. He takes his pants off and he tries to have sex with her, but for reasons I, I'm not going to go into, he can't. Finally, he hits her on the head with all his strength with the rock. He stashes the body in an abandoned car and he rides away on his old moped, almost hitting that 1970 Buick. At the time, he was dating a young woman named Muriel. 
He had never seen Fisher before. He claimed to have never had sex before. And this is why he says he attacked Fisher. And we know this to be a lie because he raped O'Brien. And finally, something I want to throw in here. Did MX have access to Montreal? And this is an unanswered question that has frequently come up in relation to the Sharon Pryor murder, particularly due to the similarities between the O'Brien and Pryor crime scenes, the, the level of violence in them. In fact, an early article on the Pryor case references this question, albeit indirectly, and it says, police are considering the possibility of a link between Pryor being slain and the slaying of Norman, uh, Norma O'Brien in Chateauguay last summer. Now recall the timeline here. You first had Fisher, and that went unsolved for a year. And then in the spring of 75, you had Sharon Pryor in, in the April. And then two months later in June, you finally had uh, the Fisher case. That's the way this this unfolded. So uh, when when O'Brien went uh, missing and 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 cold, uh, and then you had the Sharon Pryor turn up, because O'Brien was still uh, cold, they were naturally thinking about a possible link. But but back to MX's possible involvement in Pryor. How possible could it have been that MX rode that little moped of his into Montreal? And as improbable as it may seem, the answer is MX did it repeatedly because he had a job in Lachine, Quebec, which is very near Point Saint-Charles, where Sharon Pryor disappeared. Do I think MX murdered Sharon Pryor? No. And now we'll go into my reasons why. I grew up on the island of Montreal in a neighborhood very similar to Chateauguay. These new suburbs right on the frontier of development. These were mixed neighborhoods, French and English. And Pierrefonds was bound by uh, Rivière du Prairies to the north and to the west, the, and highways to the east and to the south. So we'd venture out on our bikes and explore areas like Roxborough and Dollar des Ormeaux. The worst thing I ever saw when I was a kid was a, was a dead dog. And in something right out of a Stephen King novel, a bunch of us heard this rumor that there was a dead dog next to the rail tracks down in the town of Roxborough. One Saturday, we all set out on foot on those tracks. I remember it took forever, and eventually we saw it, resting down this embankment. Its eye was oozing yellow pus. And this whole thing left me feeling sad and empty. We would hear rumors of kids getting kidnapped or killed, but it was all just a, a lot of schoolyard, you know, talk. I never heard of the Chateauguay killer growing up. I would have been 11, 10 at the time. Though I knew Chateauguay and Laval and Longay were to the south and north and east of where I lived, I'd never been there. I would occasionally take the train into downtown, but I, I never left the island of Montreal unless it was on a vacation with my parents. I suppose my parents knew about these things because they read the newspapers. My, probab uh, my uh, father uh, most definitely knew about the Sharon Pryor case because he worked in Lachine, Quebec. I didn't, as a kid, read papers. I was too busy taking books out of the library on UFOs and Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster. <laughs> a little recap on the Sharon Pryor case. 
The murder of 16-year-old Sharon Pryor happened after the July 9th, 1974 murder of 12-year-old Norma O'Brien and a little before the June 23rd, 1975 murder of 14-year-old Debbie Fisher. In an eerie twist of fate, Sharon Pryor had been following the O'Brien case in the newspapers. Sharon disappeared on Saturday evening, March 29th, 1975. She'd been at her home at 445 Congregation Street in Point Saint-Charles with friends and family when she decided to go out to meet friends, including her boyfriend, at a local pizza parlor. She left her house around 7.30 p.m. She left behind her bus pass and any money, and she decides to decline the author of a, a offer of a friend to accompany her to the pizza parlor. And her destination is five blocks away. Marina's Pizza is at 2050 Wellington Street at the corner of Avenue Ash, and she never makes it to her destination. Pryor's body was found just three days later, April 1st, 75. She's found in a field at Chemin du Lac uh, in Longueuil by Jacques Bertrand, a beekeeper. Bertrand, who keeps bees on the property, had been told to go check the lock on the gate. Someone had observed that it was open. Pryor was badly beaten. She had choke marks on her neck. She had choked on her own blood. Her nose was broken, and the assailant had crushed her chest with his, with his knee. And the autopsy uh, showed a, a number of things, as we said, that she was raped. Notably, that the blows to her head were most likely caused by a pointed instrument, maybe a ring on the finger of the assailant as he was punching. Uh, partially chewed tape found in her hair meant that Pryor was most likely gagged. And Sharon most likely died Tuesday afternoon, which would have meant that she was held captive from Saturday evening through that Tuesday morning. We're going to now circle back to the original trajectory, um, looking at Sharon Pryor and any link to the Shadowgate killer. And as you can see, there's, there's some similarities between the cases of Sharon Pryor and Norma O'Brien. To summarize, they died roughly nine months apart, and in fairly close vicinity, prior on the island of Montreal slash Longay, uh, both regions about 30 minute drive from the O'Brien Chateauguay location. Both were adolescent girls, O'Brien 12, prior 16. Both were raped, savagely beaten, and choked to death in a brutal manner. And as late as 2010, people on the internet have still been probing a connection possibly between the O'Brien and Pryor cases. So the question comes up, did the Shattagay killer, who we've dubbed MX, ever have cause to be in the vicinity of Sharon Pryor? And as we said, the answer is yes. According to his confession, in June of 1975, MX was working at Record Tools Limited at 5110 Fairway Avenue in Lachine, Quebec. His confession reads, The 23rd of June, 1975, I took my motorbike to go to Lachine, Record Tools Limited at 5110 Fairway Avenue, where I work. Before anyone gets too excited with this piece of information, there are several obstacles in considering MX as a serious suspect in the Sharon Pryor murder. And the first is that 5110 Fairway Avenue is still a 20-minute ride from Point Saint-Charles. That drive would have been made in the winter in late March 1975. You can see from the photos of the Sharon Pryor site that there's still snow on the ground. And the drive would have been made on a moped. I think everyone would agree that the assailant in the Pryor case wasn't driving a moped. And finally, the level of violence inflicted on Norma O'Brien is very formidable for the then 16-year-old MX, but it doesn't quite fit the Pryor profile. Simply put, the assailant 
MX is too young, too skinny, and he doesn't wear any jewelry that could have caused the damage borne out by the prior autopsy. Remember the references to the, the rings causing the damage and the body blows. And there, just to back that up, there are photos of MX that I have online. Uh, um, and in comparison to officers who are escorting him, who do have rings on their fingers and are much more mature, thicker than MX. MX is just a juvenile kid. There's, he doesn't even wear a watch. He's got, he, you know, he's not, he's not dressed in, you know, a, 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 a jumper from prison. He's dressed in his 1970s street clothes. So you'd assume he'd have his belongings with him as well if he's allowed to, to be escorted to jail like that. Anyway, you can look at the photo. So hopefully this lays to rest any further questions of a connection between the Chateaugay killer and Sharon Pryor. However, there's just this one troubling piece of information concerning MX and another unsolved murder that it needs to be mentioned. Record Tools, LTD, where MX worked, is about a 10-minute drive from 890 Lindsay Street, where the body of 12-year-old Tammy Leakey was found strangled in 1981. So where was MX in 1981? Presumably, if he was convicted in the O'Brien Fisher murders, he was locked up, but it's not that easy. According to some sources, he served very little time for the O'Brien and Fisher murders and in a minimum security facility, so lots of access to day passes and such. It's very conceivable that he was let out by 1981. I'm sure some of you may think that surely after all this time, the police would have looked into this. <laughs> I'm just going to laugh at that. <laughs> I don't think the police has looked into anything. Um, just remember what I said earlier about um, too much accountability leading to lapses in responsibility, something we've discussed before. Remember the crowded field of, of investigator at these sites with these cases we are talking about the involvement of at least four forces, the Sûreté de Québec, the Chateauguay Police, the Montreal Urban Task Force, and the Longuay Police. They all have involvement. Um, so where you have all of this oversight, uh, lapses happen. And if, if, if everyone is responsible, no one is responsible. And where is the Chateaugay killer today? Well, according to some, he lives and he works in the Montreal area, leading a, a normal life. One other thing that is worth mentioning, a couple of years ago, quite a fuss was made because the Convicted, well, not convicted. The let's call her. Let's just call her Carla Hamolka. Carla Hamolka, who was Paul, the Canadian serial killer Paul Bernardo's accomplice, in a, uh, accomplice in a series of murders in Saint Catharines, Ontario. Hamolka got a plea bargain, served very little time and was, I think, let out within 10 years and moved to Chateauguay to the neighborhood where the Chateauguay killer was living. Not the exact house, but certainly in the, in the same neighborhood. And this caused an uproar for that community that someone like uh, Carla Hamolka should be living in their community. My take on that is much like the Chateaugay killer who allegedly is still living in Montreal. Well, they got to live somewhere. If 
if they abide by the rules and the punishment and the plea bargains that our governments um, assign to them as a maximum penalty, then when they're, they're finished that punishment, they got to live somewhere. So it shouldn't have been a surprise that Carla Homolka ended up in the town of Chateauguay, Quebec, on the south shore of Montreal. That is our podcast for this period. I call this one the Revenge of the Um episode. <laughs> I noticed in last uh, week's episode, um, yeah, oh, there I go again. There's an awful lot of ums in there. They were even driving me crazy. So I tried to cut down on that a little bit this time. Just give you the straight information without pause. As always, go to the website, theresalore.com, T-H-E-R-E-S-A-A-L-L-O-R-E. -E -E. I'll post anything visual uh, that was of interest in this episode. You can find me on Twitter at the Tweeter, at Justice Guy, at J U S T U S G U Y. There is a YouTube account with visuals if you're so inclined. Just search on Teresa Lore on YouTube. There's a Facebook account if you like to communicate that way. Just search on who Killed Teresa, the podcast. Join up that way. And I have an email account if you want to talk to me about anything off the record. That's at TeresaLaura at gmail.com. T-H-E-R-E-S-A-A-L-L-O-R-E -E -E at gmail.com. That's it for this week. Hope you enjoyed it. Have yourself a great day.